Hello, and welcome to season four, episode one of The Open Educator, the best place to be on a Tuesday morning. Today, we kick off a new season, episode one of 2022. And this season is filled with a list of inspiring guests, creatives, leaders, activists, we're all trying to make organizations and society a better place for all. Thank you for joining us today and for taking that first step to grow personally and professionally. I would like to ask anyone who's capable and who has a camera to turn it on and listen with intention. The USF Entrepreneurship and Innovation Program is unique compared to all other programs. And we focus on three main pillars in developing the individual. One, we encourage students to create their own businesses, tech, entrepreneur, uh, restaurant owners, cafes, coffee shops, pizza places, whatever it is. And if you walk down downtown St. Pete and you walk down downtown Tampa, you will see several businesses start by alumni from the program. Two, we encourage students to become innovators within a firm. We buy all those gadgets. We use all those products and services. There is someone being innovative in those firms, managing them, and you can be one too. I have more than 15 to 20 students working at companies such as Instagram, Meta, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, you name it. And they're all managing these types of products. And what you learn in this program is important for those types of positions as well. And lastly, we are developing students who define careers they define themselves, which is different than what mo and what most other programs do. So for instance, I have students who are influencers on all the different social media channels who have created these businesses and business models and doing amazing things because of their own passion to create their own careers and live their own life how they want. Our next guest is doing just that. She is at the intersection of art and design and business and management. She is influencing here in St. Pete and the Tampa Bay area. And our next guest will share her journey and experience of growing her company from idea to a recent launch. Please give a warm welcome to co-founder and director of communications at Fairgrounds St. Pete, Olivia mansion. This is how we give applause when we have our mics off. It's sign language for applause. So Olivia, welcome. Thank you for joining us this Tuesday morning. Where does this cast find you and can you bring us up to speed? Absolutely. Thank you so much for that introduction. I really appreciate you having me today, Dr. Diazio. Um, so yeah, so my name is Olivia Manchin and I currently live and work in South St. Pete. So I'm actually just down the street from, from USF St. Pete. I live on the South side and I absolutely love living here. Um, so I can bring you up to speed. Uh, so I have a background in communication. So I earned my master's degree from Brown University in communications, education and culture. And um, after graduating Brown, uh, my partner and I moved down to St. Pete because we knew we wanted to create something. Um, Upon uh, moving here, I've had a big passion for entrepreneurship for many years, uh, and I earned my second master's degree from the University of Tampa in entrepreneurship, knowing that one day I wanted to teach entrepreneurship, I decided that the best way to teach it was to know it. So I, um, I co-founded Fairground St. Pete with my, with my partner um, and a couple other business partners. It's, it's been a true labor of love, and um, I'm excited to really take you through that entire process of idea from literally post-its to well, you can buy a ticket and come to Fairground St. Pete today. And for some context, Fairground St. Pete is Tampa Bay's first immersive art and technology destination. It's explorable, it's immersive. There's over 60 artists that you can explore their artwork. And just imagine stepping into an artist's mind um, and being able to explore one of their artworks. Um, and we're 15,000 square feet and yeah, and I'm just really excited to be here today. Wonderful, and I wanna dig in on this process and I want to prime the audience to listen to how Olivia describes 
her process and what, what she went through and her co-founders went through. Because in fact, these are very similar processes that we utilize in our classes in each of them at different levels. So I'm curious, Olivia, how did Fairground start, Fairground St. Pete start? And maybe you can give us a, the incubation process or what happened in the beginning? Absolutely. So after moving to St. Pete, my partner and I knew that we wanted to collaborate on a project together. We knew that we wanted, um, he's in art and technology and I was in communications and education and entrepreneurship. And we decided to start a, a meetup. We're literally on meetup.com. We created a free meetup where people could come together and we could talk about art and technology. So that's basically how it all started. Um, I basically did all of the marketing and communications and he would bring in the expertise in art and technology. And it was during that time um, that him and I developed a company where we were like, you know, we love art and technology. We'd love to help people um, create uh, ex experiences like this. And because we started this meetup, we were actually, uh, it's truly kismet. We were connected to our now co-founder, uh, Liz Dimmitt, who was looking to create an immersive art experience. And when she was looking around St. Pete, who was doing art and technology? Well, it was actually McCall Manchin and I who were doing art and technology um, and we had this meetup. So we were becoming recognized in this area as the you know people who know art and tech. I like that uh, for a few reasons and something that's kind of underplayed or very difficult to uh, get over, at least in the initial stage of, of anyone's entrepreneurial journey. But what I hear you saying, I'm trying to connect it to what we're learning in classroom is this idea that you created this meet meetup to find like-minded people. This is a form of research of testing the waters, building a community of people who have similar interests, similar ideas, who want to collaborate. Uh, it sounds like you were able to um, enroll people in your broader vision that you had and then sharing and kind of ultimately incubating th this idea. Lastly, what separates a lot of the other programs compared to entrepreneurship and innovation is being out in the community. If you're not out in whatever the market or the community is, it's very difficult to constantly get feedback. So these are wonderful examples. I know you went through some sort of um, I, uh, ideation workshop. Where did that fall to, to within that process? And we often in class in education, oh, do a brainstorming, oh, ha, ha, ha. But I love your story about how yours uh, developed and why it's so practical in your situation and even many others that I have. Absolutely. So after, you know, after Mikhail Manchin and I met uh, our co-founder Liz Dimmitt, and she told us this vision for this immersive art experience, we were like, yes, let's work together. Let's do this. Um, let's create this immersive experience. And the first thing that we did was Mikhail and I hosted a ideation workshop for, for all of us and for some stakeholders here um, that included some of the architects we were working with um, and some of like our colleagues and some just native uh, people of St. Pete in Florida. So this ideation workshop essentially was literally eight hours long. I like, um, we had four hour session, we had lunch and then we had four hours and we all went into a conference room, imagine hundreds of post-its um, and we basically went through a process of um, and for some context, Fairground St. Pete is themed around weird, wacky, wonderful Florida. So in order to develop the concepts of Florida, we needed to understand, let's start at the definition of what Florida is. What do people perceive Florida is? What does Florida feel like? What does Florida look like? What, um, what are the uh, perceptions, like both positive and negative? Um, so we literally had everybody go through this ideation process and go step by step um, in developing and fleshing all of that out. And because we're also a storytelling company and we believe that storytelling is truly massive um, in communicating not only your vision, um, but helping your customer understand what you're trying to convey. Uh, it, a lot of the stories that we actually tell at Fairground CMP today came from that workshop. Um, 
And as just like a communications documentation fanatic, we, I actually have documentation of from that day, even before that through today um, of that ideation workshop and everything that came out of it. It was hundreds and hundreds of, of ideas, but I would say a good 20% of it we actually use today. Thank you for sharing that because we of, often kind of put this on the back burner or don't necessarily take it serious, but this is a wonderful example of getting to what I would call challenging some of the underlying assumptions. And what I would call you challenging the underlying assumptions or not removing your biases is what is the definition of Florida? And everyone, you know, maybe there might've been many people who were longstanding Floridians or locals, but going to that root level starts building a common idea, a common understanding, and it removes a lot of the biases that maybe the founders had or any individual come up with a clearer understanding and common language in order to move a venture or an idea. And I think you guys would agree, if anyone has gone into the course modules, I always start with defining the concepts or the challenges of defining it. And we, we try to do that with creativity, we try to do that with innovation, we try to do that with scalability, design thinking and, and other concepts. Because if we're not all on the same page, and we have a different language or a different understanding of what Florida is, then we might have a different understanding of what our organization is, what our strategy, what our ethos, what our brand, and really what type of experience uh, Olivia and her team is ultimately going to create in our venture. So it's ultimately a foundation. And she mentioned she had to lead and facilitate. So it's not good enough to be able to participate as the next level entrepreneur, innovator, leader, and creative, you have to be able to facilitate that as well. And that takes a different skill than just being a participant. Loved it, wonderful. I'd like to know, so, and even the mention of storytelling, it's not just branding, it's not just uh, communications, it's deeply tied to what innovators do, what entrepreneurs do, and creatives do. That's how you're gonna enroll people and really communicate your idea. And we learned that in our class. And this is why you guys do the videos that you do. This is why you create the presentation. So what happened after the ideation workshop? So after the ideation workshop, we, you know, we had all these ideas and um, all of that data, I actually ended up putting on an Excel sheet. And I think that Excel sheet even, I think it has like 700 lines of data and we really wanted to synthesize it and then correlate, okay, from all of these 700 pieces of data, what is the, what are the reoccurring themes that keep coming up? Um, so we were able to see these reoccurring themes. We were able to understand um, what direction we want to go to. Um, we under, we also were like, okay, there's a lot of negativity that kind of came out just because there's stigmas and everything that you do. Um, we were like, okay, we don't really want to address the negative parts. That's not really what we're doing. So, um, from there, we uh, we had the the warehouse that we wanted to build out of, um, and of course, the next piece of it is you know you need the money, <laughs> you need the money. You got to like pay for all these things. Um, so what we did as a team is that we started doing uh, research to put together like a presentation, like literally like a deck, um, like a Google slide deck of. Uh, our competitor and our like com competitor analysis and like our competitive landscape to understand what are the other companies in the world and um, in this community that are doing something similar to us. So um, we started doing all that research, started analyzing um, what are those companies making annually? Like how many tickets do they sell? How much money do they make? What sorts of artists do they bring? Um, and so all of that research we started creating because we needed to raise funds and find an investor. And an investor wants to understand that you're going to be a good steward of your money. They want to understand that because um, it's their money you're, you're working with. So um, they want to understand that you understand your business. They want to understand that you know your business model, that you understand your customers. So literally, like it felt very academic just being able to go through and find all of these comp like competitors. And um, the beautiful thing about understanding your competitor is that you know, it really, it doesn't deter what you're doing. So as an entrepreneur, if there's somebody else that's doing it, don't feel like, oh, I can't do that because someone else is doing it. Um, no one's going to do it in the way that you do it. And um, there's more than enough to go around. So um, for us, we understood that there was competitor, our competitor we had in Tokyo 
Um, we had competitors in um, in Las Vegas, in uh, New Mexico. Um, there were some popping up in Miami, here in uh, here in Florida. And the good thing about that is that that's helping your um, your investor know that this model is working and it can generate revenue. So even though it's new and we had to educate people here in St. Pete about what we are, there is this thing that the investor is like, okay, like this model works. This is a, like, this will, um, this will generate money and this, this will allow you to pay me basically my investment back. So we went through that deck we created it as a team. We learned a ton um, as as a co-founding team, and then um, the next step was basically to pitch this deck to a potential investor. So, um, you know, and, and a point to never underestimate the the value of your network because our co-founder um, was connected to Jeff Vinnick, who is um, the the owner of the Tampa Bay Lightning, and. Um, we proposed uh, to him and his wife, Penny Vinick, to see if uh, them and the F Vinick family office would be um, our, basically our primary investor. And um, they were, they're just such wonderful people and they're big supporters of Tampa Bay. They're big supporters of technology and innovation and they're big supporters of the arts. So the fact that Fairground St. Pete was a technology company in Tampa Bay, um, supporting artists and entrepreneurs, I think for them was just like this fusion of just like, it just made sense for them. And it was like perfect timing. And uh, so that meeting that we got called to was, was absolutely wonderful. We sent him the deck in advance. We all prepared. We all like quizzed each other questions. Like, what if you could ask this? Or what if you could ask that? Um, and we went through like a, you know, like just a presentation with each other constantly. Um, we went to downtown, we met in his office and it was absolutely wonderful. And he became um, our primary investor for Fairground St. Pete. Um, and we're lucky that we didn't have to go out and raise too much more money. We also have a family friend that actually uh, contributed um, to, to Fairground St. Pete as well. So, you know, because uh, we're stewards of this money and because we have to meet regularly with our board, it helps that we have just two primary investors and we don't have, you know, a group of people that we have to be accountable to. So as y'all are raising funds, just be cognizant of um, keeping, you know, try to keep your investors to really like one, one or two at the, you know, at the most. Wonderful. Uh, my apologies for dropping a little, but thank you. And I think this is really deep insight in the sense of limiting your investor pool. First of all, it's amazing to have people like Jeff Vinnick supporting you, and it's not easy to get an interview. So this is something that you've been able to cultivate through your network, through your, your co-founders. Uh, and so this is the, because of going out in the community, because of creating that, that meetup, because of doing that legwork early on, it helped pay off later. I'm curious to know a bit more about the research and what role did research play um, in terms of identifying maybe your ideal market or a target market? Yeah, definitely. So in researching all these different um, like competitors that are in the world, we were able to, you know, research their social media following and research like who are the people that are going and posting about these things. We were reading like articles. So we read like things in the New York Times um, and a bunch of just re different research that was saying millennials love experiences and are spending their money on experiences and not stuff. And then they were saying that Gen Zs are even more like like that and Gen Z even more so would rather live at home and spend all their money going to cool things. So it's helpful to see it's like, not only is this company relevant now, but it's relevant in the next few years because this upcoming uh, generation that's gonna have uh, revenue and money, um, they'll be able to, to spend it on your business. So we did so, so much research that just kept like validating what we were, uh, we were like telling ourselves and what we were intuitively feeling. Um, and, you know, sometimes I would definitely like say, like, trust your intuition, trust your gut. And sometimes it's hard to put research behind what your gut is saying. But, um, you know, we were lucky that the research was literally saying, yes, this is going to work. Um, and yes, it's popular not only in this country and in different states, but it's popping up all over the world. So there's like... Um, 
different experiences like this popping up in Mexico City, in Tokyo, um, in uh, in Amsterdam. So it's just like it's showing that it's like this global trend, um, especially since we're in a global market. And St. Pete and Florida is a tourist destination. So for us, it's not just reaching those who are in St. Pete and Tampa Bay, but being able to reach those globally and being a destination where people from all over the world want to come and visit. Thank you for sharing uh, the emphasis that research is so important, definitely in my scalability and for my design thinking student consulting course, students have to solve an innovation challenge and one of them part a significant part of that project is doing research. That is not necessarily something that we and the university do that well at teaching students, but we can see from your example how important it is to know your competitors to not even just the one, local ones, but the regional, national, and international, because not only can you see how they're competing in the market through all the different trends, but also get inspiration from them, what works, what doesn't work, and have data to support your argument on which direction you should be going in uh, for your strategy and for the decisions you have to make. So there's not, I cannot emphasize enough of the role to our audience that research plays. And while it's not easy to get the data, while it's not easy to uh, test your assumptions, which we can tie to agile, to lean, to design thinking, to different uh, market analysis, this is critical. And this is why we do that for our classes. Um, you guys have also had an extra challenge, Olivia, this idea of when you launched, you had one game plan and strategy, and then you had to pivot, or like many of us had to pivot, uh, with a pandemic, but your art, interactive technology, how did you guys deal with this pandemic or how are you dealing with this pandemic? Yeah, that's, I know exactly how like current. Um, yeah. So just to put like some perspective. So basically this was, you know, all, like 2019, we were doing research. We had the deck um, early 2020. So like January, February, um, you know, we got our investment, which was amazing. We were in the Tampa Bay Times. Like it was like, we get this money. We doing this thing. This is amazing. Um, March hits and here we are, March 2020, um, and a pandemic hits. And, you know, we had this vision of creating a, a physical space that people come and touch things. So we didn't know if we were both going to go anywhere, let alone touch anything. Um, so it was around this time we were like, oh my gosh, all right. So, um, but we decided to just move forward and we said, we have an investment. We, um, we're so blessed to have an investor who didn't like our investor could have said, no, I want out. Um, and that could have been a possibility, but they said, no, we, we believe in what you're doing. Um, we believe that, that you'll figure it out. So just go for it. So we had planned to do an artist call later in 2020. We were like, yeah, like later in the summer, we'll like call, do the call to artists. Well, which basically means we ask artists to apply and then we, they propose artwork to put in our experience. And we decided to do it sooner. We thought everything is canceled. Artists are at home doing nothing. We might as well just put a call out and get this ball rolling. So I think it was a blessing in disguise that we were able to start the whole process sooner because everything will cost more and take more time than you expect. So grateful that we started sooner. Um, two, we decided that we were always a technology company, but we really decided then we were like, we're definitely a technology company. Um, and so our team, instead of, we were like, all right, everybody's gonna touch things. Instead of touching things, let's do touchless buttons. So our um, technology team developed these buttons that you actually hover your hand over and by tr that triggers the sensor and that activates, um, activates the button. So when you come to Fairground St. Pete, there's touchless buttons everywhere. And all of that came from the pandemic of like, we don't think people are going to want to touch anything ever again. So um, there's touchless buttons everywhere. And so it really helped us pivot as a as a company in a in a really powerful way. And the one of the cool things, too, is our first hire. So it was the four co-founders. The first person that we hired was our technology lead. We decided the most important person that we can hire is a technologist. And the wild thing is that the way we met him is that he had come to our meetup like six months prior. Um, so again, like once again, that meetup that we had created bringing in and actually James Kieran, who is our uh, technology um, 
like the highest person we have in the company right now in technology. Uh, he's still with the company and he's been with us since early 2020. So um, it's just like so powerful. And the other thing I'll say, we ended up having to move into my house and run our company out of our house. And there was like, <laughs> it was wild. It was a wild time. But um, just again, like not getting discouraged by what the external world looks like, but taking those challenges and pivoting. And um, if you believe in your mission, you believe what you're doing, just go for it. Just pivot accordingly. I love it because here is the really the example of where opportunities lie. Or you can say, oh, our, change, our business plan is not, we can't do it, we can't follow our, our, our strategy. But you made an opportunity of the situation. Um, it's, if it's able to call out, get higher quality artists or more artists or more to choose from the population or who you can recruit, reducing cost as a result. And this is a combination of a lot of the skills that we teach in the programs. One, of course, creative or creative thinking but also convergent, divergent, different opportunities. And this is really the intersection of where creativity, entrepreneurship, and innovation lie. You guys are looking for opportunities when everyone else sees a pandemic or a problem, and you're able to execute them to, to reap the benefits, whatever that may be, to create value for it in a different way. So I love that example. And I love that you mentioned that you guys are a tech company. So this is a clear example where one might say, oh, they're into our museum, gallery. No, they identify themselves as tech and then it's helped them because they view them as tech in their ethos as tech. They're able to come through the pandemic in a very different shape than seeing themselves as a museum or a gallery or something of that sort. So fascinating stories for enlightening us and real life examples of how we can or how we need to be thinking. So I'm curious to know, um, reflecting back, is there other than um, the examples that you gave that's still pushing the boundary of opportunity that you see going forward uh, now that you have been able to get over literally the first few waves and more opportunity emerging as a result from, from this? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think there's definitely still a lot of opportunity to be found, you know, amidst what's going on. Um, you know, the cool, so one of the things we do field trips, so we've been collaborating with schools and being as a destination that um, kids can come to, which I think has been really positive. Um, but yeah, I, honestly, I think that there's constant um, opportunity in everything that we do to that and, and I'm always asking myself like what am I not seeing um and like what oppor opportunities am I not seeing and so I think surrounding ourselves with a co-founding team and just people around us that were like uh like am I thinking this about this the wrong way and being okay with being wrong or or uh, not knowing at all I think has been like really really enlightening um and I always like try to think like okay like me in the future like what would I need to know now kind of thing um and not getting stuck in in today. And I think as an entrepreneur, it's easy to get stuck in only looking down because you're, you're like in the weeds and in trying to get to, through today, but you have to be able to every once in a while step above it all to kind of like look at the bigger picture. So I think there's like this constant, um, you know, shifting that is like needing to happen. I, I love the examples because it shows the type of mindset that you need that one, you, you may not know all the information, you you have this novice or beginner mindset. You you realize that it's maybe about managing the knowledge and information you don't have, which is actually a paradigm within strategy that doesn't get taught in in university. But we'll say it's deeply embedded in entrepreneurial innovation, where uh, you have to be thinking about what you're missing in order to find it, because other people are also missing. That's how you might create some opportunities. So what do you see as the biggest challenges that you've had building uh, the factory or fairground St. Pete? We've had many challenges. So, um, you know, one of the challenges for sure is the fact that we're a permanent space. And some of the spaces that we had researched early on um, were pop-ups. And, you know, the city and the fire marshal and um, many like city zoning views permanent very differently. So we are held to the highest, most strict standard. And I don't think we were expecting it to be as rigorous as it was. 
Um, so I think that was a big, big challenge. Um, the other thing, you know, once we commissioned the artists, they were ready to go. We we were like, yes, you, the artwork that you proposed, we loved. Here's the commission. Here's everything. Go and run with it. Um, we were then probably like about six weeks after that, after artists had already started making their artwork, um, the fire marshal let us know that we needed to use fire rated wood for everything. Um, so fire rated wood, what that means is that if there's a fire, it burns slower um, and regular wood will burn really quickly. And so, you know, they're always trying to buy themselves time when there's an emergency. So um, fire rated wood, the unfortunate part is that it, the color is different. It's been treated. So it has this like cherry look to it. Um, it's like three times more expensive. So, um, that was just like completely unfortunate. So I literally like found out one day that afternoon, I'm literally calling every single artist, um, like apologizing to them being like, I'm so sorry. Like, and there, you know, some artists took it well, some artists did not take it well. Um, you know, you basically just have to get chewed out and then you're just like, you know, it is what it is. So um, that was just like a big learning curve for sure that we like none of us anticipated whatsoever. That was a very big challenge. Um, and then during COVID and like just like with everything, it just takes so much time. So um, construction took longer than we expected and we were repurposing a warehouse. So just trying to get everything like the floor is ready and like the walls ready while also trying to bring in art and trying to build on top of that. So it's almost like if you're trying to renovate your kitchen while also trying to decorate it at the same time, it's like you have to do one first and then the other. So trying to do both at the same time was uh, very stressful. Um, and then another little thing, like you can't, when you have a company, you can't avoid working with lawyers and working um, with contracts. That's like very important. And originally we had hired a business lawyer who was helping us develop all our contracts. So when we were commissioning artists, when we were purchasing artwork from them, we purchased, um, we worked with our lawyer to create a contract for these artists. And these contracts that we got it from our business lawyer were business contracts and they were way too complicated for a, an artist relationship. So these contracts were over 20 pages long. So if I'm like buying artwork from, you know, from you, Dr. Diazio, and you're like, I'm buying a, pa a painting, it's a little excessive if I give you a 27 page contract. Like, you're just gonna be like, what the, like, this is like a little much. Um, so we had to go through those hiccups of a few artists being like, what? What does page 17 B, C, number one mean? And then we're like, oh my God, this is way too complicated. Um, and then for context, it was me. It was like, I was the artist relations person and my co-founder managing 64 artists. So these were a lot too, too many conversations. So it was like, all right. So we hired another lawyer who had experience in entertainment and working with artists. So he understood that things needed to be simple, clear, not complicated and not overwhelming. So we hired him um, and then he synthesized our contracts to seven to 10 pages. And those seven to 10 pages included photographs. So you look at that contract and it's just like, it doesn't seem overwhelming. It doesn't seem weird. You don't, um, there isn't like distrust. So um, that was a huge, huge learning curve. And so I would definitely say when looking for lawyers, make sure that you're finding the niche um, in which you're in. <laughs> Wonderful. These are invaluable insights. I really like the example about the pop-up versus permanent. And for those who don't know, a pop-up might be a, a, a short-term experiment or, or, or uh, ex experience where uh, you're testing the market. You're there to see if there's interest, to see what works, what doesn't, and then evolve as a way of reducing costs, et cetera. As Olivia mentioned, their route to go permanent created this open this other box of code and other things that you have to do research and figure out as an entrepreneur um, if you choose to go that route. So these are great examples. Thank you. Society has romanticized entrepreneurship and the entrepreneurial lifestyle. We all dream of being at the beach while we're making passive income. I'm not sure that's how it works. So how do you get past doing the things you don't love or not so passionate about? 
Oh, that's so good. Um, yeah, entrepreneurship is so funny. You know, it's like, I'm going to be my own boss. Like, here we go. And then you literally, you don't realize that you end up with hundreds of bosses because your customers are your boss. So you just realize that you like traded one thing for like hundreds of people who are like, I love that. I don't love that. That's better. That needs it. But and like customers will just tell you they won't sugarcoat it. They won't like prep, like, you know, compliment sandwich it. They're just going to like lay it on you. Um, so entrepreneurship is funny like that. But, um, you know, I, I try to stay sane in like so many different ways. Um, from the beginning, thankfully, I surrounded myself with people who were not only really supportive of uh, my path of choosing entrepreneurship, which, you know, if like having friends and family, I think is really important in letting them know what you're working on, because it is all consuming, where it's like, you want to attend birthday parties, you're, you know, I'm in an industry where I'm in entertainment, so I'm nights and weekends. So I, I miss a lot. Um, but it's like an understanding that this is kind of the, the, the season of my life that I'm in. Um, so I think that's really, really important. Um, and then just being realizing that you're a whole person that you have needs that you, you know, you need to eat, you need to drink your water, you need to take naps, you need to meditate, you need to journal, you need to like, do all the things to get yourself right, so that you can show up in the workplace with your team. Um, and and be your best self. So if that means you went to bed late last night, and you can't be in the office at 8am or 9am, let people know like, hey, I'm going to be an hour late and sleep in like, just prioritizing yourself and your well being is the best thing that you can do. Um, and that's really like, it's been parallel of teaching myself entrepreneurship and being an entrepreneur, um, and staying relevant with literally I Google everything, um, and YouTube everything if I don't already know or call people to try to figure it out. Um, and two, prioritizing myself and my well being. And I think a combination of those two things literally makes you unshakable because there's so many things that are unknown. But if you and yourself are grounded, you're happy, you're okay, you're safe, you feel confident and grounded, then you can go ahead and, and figure it out. It's important to constantly recharge. Thank you for reminding us. But that means prioritizing. In order to recharge, we have to prioritize what's most important and, and create that project plan, which we do often in, in my scalability and student consulting class. Um, I'm curious to know, and I, I want to prep the students. So after I ask this question for Olivia, I want you guys to think about what questions you have for her and maybe um, thoughts or, or ideas you have for her that you guys can share in, in a q a but i want to ask you what skills have you learned the most or what skills did, did you have to learn the most launching your venture that you wish you had or you that really got put to the test mm. oh that's amazing so so many i would say the biggest one um has been my emotional intelligence and how much i've grown um in those like soft skills what they call which i wish that there's like a rebrand that goes around with the soft skills name, but um, just being able to have difficult conversations, being able to say no, um, being able to um, be empathetic with how someone is is handling things and being able to, um, you know, approach people in a way that they feel that you care, um, but that like this isn't going to fly. So um, I definitely feel like my soft skills have definitely an emotional intelligence um, has been the biggest thing that I've learned through this whole process. And I wish I would have known sooner, but it's the kind of thing that you have, you, you learn it by doing it. So without having gone through all of these things, um, I would have never learned these, like these super important skills. Um, and many of them have come through hiring. So one of the things that we did after we hired um, our first hire, which was like a super huge for us, we had to scale. So we ended up going from a company of five of us to um, over 45 of us. Um, and it happened very, very quickly. So, um, and that was literally, I was doing the job of, you know, 10 people. And then I had to figure out how many jobs were in those, um, write job descriptions for all of them and start hiring out whether I was hiring out somebody just to literally duplicate myself and do exactly what I was already doing or hire someone and hire someone who was doing something that I had no idea how to do. 
So it's definitely like can hurt your ego a little bit when you're like, I have no idea. Um, like I used to know nothing about PR or like um, news and media and all of that. I didn't really know. Um, I understand social media really well, but not that part. So I had to hire like a professional um, to do that. So sometimes you have to like, you know, just be like, I don't know that we got to hire out um, a pro to, to figure that out. So, um, so I think a combination of emotional intelligence, um, hiring, and then managing people has been just so, so huge. And I don't think I could have learned it any other way than just by doing it. Wonderful. This idea of scaling, which we have a course on scaling and this idea of constantly learning, which is the new paradigm. But I, I really enjoyed the idea that, yeah, when you had to scale, you had to hire more people. Mostly, you know, by definition, and you need, you need to do more, so you need more people and, and human resource, and you had to figure out how to do the human resources. So when we take those other classes, the HR classes, if you're a business student, you require, you can see that not only do you have to know your product and service, but these other skills in order to make your business grow. And that means figuring out how to write a job description. And if you haven't written that job description because you didn't do that job, you've never done that. You got to figure out how to do it or ask the people. And that's where your network falls in, where doing more research and utilizing the tools that are available, free, not free, et cetera. So wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. I would like to turn this over and, and allow the students to ask questions you might have. Please don't be shy. And I know you guys have really good questions because you guys have been bombarding me with questions uh, regarding the homework and the modules and, and everything. So please. Uh, Dana, if you could keep an eye on who might have their virtual hand raised, uh, because I cannot see everyone in my view. I will actually go ahead and kick it off. I have two questions. So um, my first question is, man, this was a lot of information, <laughs> but this was like a lot of good stuff. It kind of scares you, but it also really just puts, gives you like a reality. Like it really puts things into perspective because I was like, this one person is doing all these things like you're amazing. <laughs> so my two questions is, um, who would you say are three good people to know? Because you were saying a lot of things like lawyers and, and, and just a lot of different people and stuff. So who are three or two good people that, that you should know that you should have in your network? And then um, how did you choose your artists? Because I'm sure you had a lot of artists to choose from. So how did you choose them? Oh, Dana, those are beautiful questions. Three people to know. So that's first I'm flattered. And I really, that's really sweet of you to say all of that. And I think if I, in hindsight, if in 20, early 2019, I would have known all the work that this all took, yes, I would do it all over again, but it, I would have done it very like fearfully and very like, I don't know if I could do that because I am a 180 of the person that I was then. Um, I like don't even recognize her. I'm like, oh my God. Uh, so you grow through the process and the challenges help you, you rise to the occasion, which I think is like very, very cool thing about entrepreneurship. Um, it just changes you it's like as a human. So it's, it's just, I just love entrepreneurship so much. Um, but you know, you do what's necessary in front of you and you do what's necessary and what the moment requires. And then you look back and then you're like, how, even I look, I'm like, how did I even do that? But you just put one step in front of the other and you just trust that you'll figure it out and you YouTube it and you call people and you just figure it out. Um, so in regards to the three people, I really, more than anything, I would invest that time and energy into yourself. Um, invest the time and energy into you yourself being confident and being the type of person that will seek those three people out. Um, because there isn't one, because even the lawyers, like we've worked with a handful of them and I'm like, and they don't all do exactly what you need them to do. Um, but if you're the kind of person who is investing time in yourself and then you're also very good about networking so when you meet somebody and i know adana you're very good at this um you send them a message like hey it was really nice meeting you today at this event i look forward to connecting one day um and you just become uh, consistent in whoever you meet you just always put in the back of your head that you're like i might be able to help this person or this person might be able to help me 
and you just put it out into the universe and it comes back. Like Dr. Diazio and I met back in 2016, 2017, and we've stayed in touch and it's like incredible. Um, but you just always are in the back of your head of like, one day I might help this person and you might not, and you might, it might come back. And so many people in my network, I've been able to like pull from and them from me. And it's been like so beautiful. Um, and just, you know, never underestimate you, you might have people in your network now that might be, um, you know, you might be speaking in their classes one day about like the, what you worked on. So, um, I would say that. And then in regards to our artist call, it was, um, we went through a process with the artist. So the first thing that we did um, is that we did a call for artists. So we basically told all artists in the state of Florida, we're, we're opening this crazy immersive art experience. We want you to apply. And the first step was an RFQ. An RFQ means request for qualifications. So all that is, is an artist had to submit almost like their resume, the work history and what they've created. Um, and that helped us understand like, can this artist be a part of this process? Can this artist handle this artist uh, artist call? Then after that, we did an RFC, which is a request for concept. So a request for concept is literally like take a napkin and just sketch out your idea. Um, and then they kind of sent us that. And all of this, once we selected the artist, they were under NDA. So NDA is a non-disclosure agreement. They basically, you know, legally they couldn't spill the beans of what we were working on because we wanted to keep it secret. Um, and then from the RFC, then it, they went through the artist commissioning phase, which is when it was like, okay, we love your idea. Now tell us how much is it going to cost? How much time is it going to take? What is the final product going to look like? Um, and then we went through the contracting phase. So um, we went through all of that process and then um, slowly through all that, all of the artwork that you see at Fairground Safety today is what emerged from that. That's awesome. I love that. And I love how you were like super meticulous, breaking it down, telling us exactly the process that you went through to get them. That is a lot of uh, legwork. That's a lot of legwork. And I like what you said about um, us really just kind of investing in ourselves because um, in today's society, I feel like there's a lot of things that we can do as entrepreneurs, like things that back in the day, like you feel like you had to be super rich or super, you know, intelligent or just, you know, this, this specific type of person to be successful, but really like with some Google, some classes and some networking, you can really do make things happen. And I feel like that's kind of like what you did. So, um, I love that he decided to have you because you are, you're just like a normal person who kind of made it big, you know? So it kind of like really inspires us. So thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much, Adana. It's been a pleasure. I can't wait to meet you in person. I see Dia has his uh, hand raised. Ms. Olivia, thank you very much for your time. I really, really appreciate your fascinating journey. And I really appreciate that meeting that took place in 2016, because if it wasn't, if it didn't happen, we would have not benefited from all those valuable information yeah. right now. Um, my other thing, so I'm a pre-dental school majoring in biomedical science, minoring in, uh, in entrepreneurship. And the um, reason why I, I wanted to minor entrepreneurship is because eventually I had that vision that I'm going to end up being owning my own practice and being an entrepreneur um so i believe uh, like you uh, like you said making connection is very very important i want you to, to give me advice on how like how to approach that making connection and also uh advice on my for my future that will help me mm. oh my gosh yeah no pressure no pressure dia just put your whole future in my hands <laughs> Um, first, oh my gosh, thank you. You're, I'm so flattered. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, one, I think it's, you're absolutely intelligent and uh, insightful to take entrepreneurship now because it's going to serve you. You're going to think critically in a way that uh, others won't. So you're going to make business decisions that are just going to be way smarter and you're going to be ahead of the game. So, um, so proud of you for doing that, first of all. Um, you know, in your 
don't be afraid to share your dream with people because it's amazing what happens that vulnerability. Um, everybody wants to be the hero and wants to help you. So anytime that you share that with someone like, Hey, I have a dream of owning my, you know, my own, um, my own hospital, my own dental facility. I, I have a dream of owning this. You never know whose friend of a friend of a friend um, happens to have a practice. They're retiring and you can come in and buy it from them. Um, or you can, you know, intern for someone and you just never really know. Um, and I really believe that we're powerful and we're creators and we're on this planet to create things. And when you put it out there, um, other people just love conspiring in your favor. So I would say just share your dream. Don't be afraid of it. Um, and also just be patient and do, don't be afraid of the process things. Um, it might not happen tomorrow and it might not happen in a year, but just trust that it will work out for you. And, um, and it sounds so like cliche, but it like literally does. I, you know, I spoke all of this into the world back like three years ago and it sounded crazy, <laughs> but I was like, I'm, we're going to figure it out and I'm going to do it. And here we go. Um, so yeah, so just keep going and, um, and don't be afraid to share that with people. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Yes. Uh, Zune? Please. Um, Zune. Um, thank you again for speaking with us today. Uh, I just wanted to ask, what is your favorite aspect of being an entrepreneur? Ooh, girl. Oh, Zane, that is such a good question. I love, I know, the money. Make it rain, girl, please. <laughs> We're not there yet. We're getting there. I wanted to um, say the beach. The beach. Oh, my. Do you see how pale I am? I have not seen the beach in a real long time, Dia, <laughs> please. Um, one day no not there yet but my thing you know i'm a lifelong learner Janae. like i love to learn and um it's why i have two master's degrees it's why i left school why i love dr diazio's class I, why i love you all um is because i love learning and i love that entrepreneurship allows you to constantly learn um for example we had our grand opening last month and I've never done a grand opening. This is my first business. Like, how do you do a grand opening? And I literally was like, how do you do a grand opening? Um, and then it's like literally bought the balloons and it's like, oh, the mayor needs to come. So you have to like apply, you have to like apply to get the mayor to come. So it's like, get the mayor and then like do the invites and there's like press release to the media and all that. Um, and now you look and it's like, we had like 60 people. We were on the news, we were on the press. Like, it was like incredible, but it's like, I had no idea. I literally never had a business. So how do I ever, how do people figure these things out? Um, so, and then it's like, oh, a ribbon. How big does the ribbon need to be? And you need big scissors. And like, who brings the big scissor? Like nobody teaches you these things. But that's what I love about entrepreneurship is like, you'd have no idea. And then one day you look back and you're like, now I know all these things and you've learned all these things. And, um, and then things change and then a pandemic happens and then you got to learn how people do it in the new world. So uh, I love the learning. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Michael, I see your hand, Henry. Yeah. Hi. Um, thank you, Olivia, for coming out. Um, I'm sorry, my camera's not working today. Um, okay. But uh, I was trying to take notes during when you were talking. There's just so much going on. I was just I'm like, wait, back up. What did she say um, for a lot of it? But so for my question, um, you said this was your first business and you were learning a lot as you went um, along the way. And I was wondering, what was your biggest resource for learning these new things that you were finding and the hiccups you found along the road? Oh, that's amazing. So for for us, it was huge that for every problem, because it was so niche, we had to um, find an expert in that industry or that field. So, for example, when we went through the fire rated like shenanigans, we had to find fire experts. And there's actually like a fire consultancy that you can hire. Um, and we were not expect that was on our budget that we did not expect that it was extremely expensive. Um, but we had to hire this like expert in fire rated things um, who has already a relationship with the fire marshal and everything to help us understand what do we need to do? 
what is that going to look like? How much is that going to cost? And what are the actions that we need to take in order to open safely and make sure that we have all the documentation? Um, and even like the paperwork was very specific and even like the materials we had to do. And then we had to do um, uh, these like videos where we like burned part of the exhibit and parts of art. And then we had to like videotape it and send it to the fire marshal so they could see um, how fast things burn. So we literally, it's like a, a photo, a video, and you have like an object and you have a timer and then you set it on fire. So we had to like film all these videos, but we like, nobody teaches you this. Like you don't learn this, like YouTube doesn't even have it. Um, so there was times we just had to like literally bite the bullet and hire experts that just do this. Um, so I would say if you like, our, my biggest resource was not only hiring the help that knew how to figure it out, um, but reaching out to our network and being like, who's ever built something and knows experts in X or Y. Um, and then aside from that, YouTube and Google, a YouTube and Google everything. <laughs> That's a great question, Michael. Awesome. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Wonderful. And I want to remind the audience, um, you know, Olivia has crafted a lot of her skills long before creating this venture. You know, if it's her master's at Brown, the work experiences she has on top of that, going for a master's in entrepreneur, this isn't taking one or two classes and then I'm going to go learn everything on Google. These, the reason why she's able to articulate all these things and address all is because of the practice she's gone through and being developing all these skills. So we met at a Toastmasters. Toastmasters is the largest public speaking club in the world. You don't, you're not good at communicating because you just rolled out of bed and you have your <laughs> camera off or on or whatever the case. These are skills that she practiced over and over and over. And to articulate these at this level, it shows the, the journey she's made. So while we may be minoring in entrepreneurship, knowing that there's so much more work that has to be done to even try to level up. And this is the things that separate an entrepreneur and an innovator and someone who's not. So we're grateful for you to be here, Olivia. For the last question I have is if you could go back to your younger self, what advice would you give her? I, ooh, that's so good. What advice would I give to my younger self? Um, I think it's the same advice I gave to Adana um, and Dia too. Just, you know, focus on yourself and your well-being. Um, because when you bring your full whole self to um, to your workplace, to your ideas, to um, to your, you know, to your business, you're just a better person. You're just, um, you just like, are, you have the clear ideas, you execute better, you communicate better. Um, and that only, ha and that's, that's like, don't believe the like hustle, 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 don't sleep, like whatever grind, like don't believe that because um, you can't think and you can't be clever and you can't be creative and creative ideas need time and space and energy and, and you to be well rested. So um, I think, yes, definitely. And, um, when I'm not doing all of these things, I also teach breath work, um, which is basically using your breath to be more confident, more, um, more productive, more efficient. And, um, I definitely wish I'd started doing breath work way sooner. Um, so I would say a combination of breath work and focusing on myself will just exponentially increase, um, all of my success and, and failures. Like there's so many failures. This is like entrepreneurship is basically you're signing up to fail every day, but just like you keep moving forward. So, but if you're well-equipped and grounded, you can handle anything. Thank you for your wisdom, for sharing, uh, your story. We plan on reaching back out to you to stay connected. If uh, the students wanted to connect with you or come visit uh, Fairground St. Pete, maybe where can they find you? Definitely. Yeah. So find me on um, on LinkedIn. I'm just Olivia Banshan and then all my degrees after my name. Um, and then or you can email me Olivia at fairgrounds.art. So, um, yeah, come to Fairground St. Pete. Love for you to come and check it out and let me know what you think. Uh, and I look forward to, to speaking and working with with all of you again. Thank you, Olivia, for spending the morning with us. I know you're busy. Uh, we've learned a lot and we'll touch base soon. So let's give Olivia a big round of applause.
say we'll be in touch. We'll be in touch for sure. Thank you so much.